Well, a very warm welcome to our evening service from Amian Park Chapel. We're delighted that you can meet with us. Our, our service this evening is very simple. We have hymns, which, because we're at home, we can sing. Uh, we have a reading from the Bible. We then seek the face of the God of heaven in prayer. And then, uh, towards the end of the service, uh, the reading from the Bible is explained. And we're delighted that our preacher this evening is Dr. Stuart Olliott. Uh, he's a dear friend to a number of us, and he's a good friend of Amy and Park Chapel. Uh, just one other notice, uh, we meet on Wednesday at 7.30 for our Bible study and prayer. It's going to be a whole church uh, Bible study and prayer meeting, and therefore we will be meeting on Zoom, and details will be sent out in due time. Well, let's begin by hearing the Word of God, and it's a song of David, and this is what he says. Sing to the Lord all the earth, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Let us pray. Our gracious and almighty God, we thank you that we have begun by reading the song of David. And we confess the Lord as we are uh, confronted by the, the splendor of your majesty, that we are out of our depth. Indeed, Lord, we cannot even begin to come to terms with just how wonderful you are. And yet, Lord, everything we've read doesn't push us away. It draws us nearer and nearer still. And we want to add our voices to that chorus of heaven to sing to you the living and the true God, to declare your salvation, to worship you in the splendor of holiness, to tremble before you, the true, the living, the eternal God. Our Father, we confess that with all our light, we are in darkness. With all our heat, we shall be cold. With all our wisdom, we are foolish. But we therefore pray that you would send down your Holy Spirit Lord, that he might come and uh, give to us that resurrection help and animate us and revive us that we might worship you, that we might offer worship that is pleasing in your sight and that, oh, our God, that you would come and meet with us. We pray, gracious Father, that in this hour, that you would get all the glory, because this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our first hymn. Uh, if you have the, one of the church hymn books, it's 152. That lovely hymn of John Newton's, How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes his sorrows and heals his wounds and drives away his fear. Let's sing.
God's Word again, and our reading is found in Matthew's Gospel, and it's Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to read from verse 25 to the end of the chapter. So Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, beginning to read at verse 25. At that time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things <clears throat> from the wise and understanding and have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's come again to our God in prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious and almighty God, how we love the name Jesus. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. Lord, in that name is a universe of wonder and blessing and joy. We think of the name that was given, the name that was announced. You shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. We thank you that you, the great God of heaven, have stepped into our world in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ, that he left his footprints 
on the shores of Galilee, his blood upon a Roman cross. And we thank you that he came into this world not to condemn, but to save. We thank you for the life that he lived. We thank you for the, the beauty of that life. We thank you that we read that he went about doing good and time and again we, we come across scenes of distress, people laboring in this cursed world under a crushing yoke. And then we see that Jesus is here and we know that all will be well. And yet our God is equally true that <clears throat> he came to his own but his own received him not. And we think as we go through the Gospels, there is this increasing tension and hostility. And in the end, the one true innocent, the one who did love you with all his heart and his neighbour as himself, that lawless hands took him, and wicked men nailed him to the cross. But we thank it was all in your perfect plan and will, that he should go to that place of cursing and shame and wrath, to bear our sins away, and to put us right with you. We rejoice uh, this evening in the empty tomb. We think of that first day of the week, that, that Sunday morning, uh, at the breaking of the light, and a far greater light. He is risen, he's not here. And we thank you that, Lord, on this Lord's day, that we rejoice in the empty tomb. We, we think, Lord, of that first Sunday when our Lord met with his disciples. He was among them. He showed himself to them. And our God, as we meet together, Lord, yes, in our homes, yes, virtually, but we pray that we might know our Lord Jesus Christ among us, that he would come and unveil himself to us in all his majesty and grace. And that, Father, we would indeed, as he showed his disciples then, the print of the nails, that, as it were, we would see the print of the nails again. I know that really here is the Saviour of the world, the Saviour that we need. So, Lord, as the Word is open tonight, and as that Word is explained and taught, we pray that we would not be spectators, we pray that, Lord, as it were, that you would reach across to us through that screen. And this word would rejoice our hearts. It would raise us, Lord, to newness of life. That it would make wise the simple. That it would convert the soul. That, Lord, we would find that it is a word that, that is cleansing. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And Lord, that we might discover to our taste that here is a sweetness sweeter than the, the drippings of the honeycomb, and that here is a treasure that is worth more than all the treasures of this world, that these are the very words of life. Oh, gracious God, come and meet with us and change us and conquer us, and if we know you and love you, that we might the more adore you and trust you. We pray that, Lord, if we are a stranger to you, that tonight you would call us by name. Whatever, Father, we pray that we would find that this is a word fitting, a word for this time, a word for our hearts tonight and for the days to come. Father, what we pray for ourselves, Lord, we pray wherever your word is proclaimed and taught. We particularly remember our brothers and sisters in Sri Lanka. We thank you, Lord, for um, Pastor Subramanayim at Paliutu. We thank you, Lord, for Pastor Mahendran at Mutu. We pray that, Lord, that you would be with your servants there. Lord, we know for them the day has passed. It's already uh, Monday, but we ask our God that you would watch over them and keep them and bless them, and as they seek to pastor and teach your people, <clears throat> that they would have a wisdom that's not their own, and grace upon grace, and that, Lord, for your believing people there, that you might build them up and strengthen them, that those churches might go on to maturity, to fruitfulness, and that, Lord, you would continue to dwell with them. Our Lord Jesus went about doing good. He's done us good. We pray that you continue in those churches to do your people good. And that, Lord, that that circle of light 
and blessing might increase and others would be brought into the fold and all for your glory. So we trust all these things, our Father God, into your hands. Take our sins away. Sprinkle the blood upon our consciences. Grant us assurance tonight. Come and meet with us and reveal to us your face in the face of Jesus Christ because we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we come to God's Word, we're going to sing a hymn which is all about uh, God's Word, God meeting with us and speaking to us. So we're going to sing, Speak, O Lord. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl needs to hear these three wonderful words. They're found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 28. Now, Matthew's Gospel, like all the New Testament, was, was written in the ordinary Greek of ordinary people. In Greek, it's, it's three wonderful words. Dolce pros me. In English, it's three wonderful words. Come to me. And Gabriel gets three wonderful words. Deuch atavi. And they're tender words. How, how can I describe how tender they are? Well, we go back a few years and 
I've been married to Doll for less than three weeks. I come in one Wednesday and she's crying. I say, whatever's wrong? And through the sobs she says, I've spent all the money. I gave her so much money for the housekeeping each week and we'd come to Wednesday and she'd spent it all and she was breaking her heart. Now, if you're a husband and you have a, a bride of less than three weeks, uh, what do you say? Well, you say, come here. Now, let's put the, the camera 40 years later on. We've been married 40 years now. And one day I come in in the evening and there's my wife of, of 40 years and, and she's weeping. I must be a tyrant for, because when I explain why she's weeping, I say, what, what, what's wrong? What's wrong? And she says, well, it's like this. She says, I picked up a bundle of washing from a chair and I didn't know that on the chair was the hands-free landline phone and on the chair was the mobile phone. And I picked it all up and I put it in the washing machine and the washing's clean, but the phones are ruined. What does a husband of 40 years say to his wife when she's crying over something so really trivial? Come here. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. Come to me. We could actually translate it. Come now to me. Come here. Well, they're tender words, and they provoke a number of questions. Three questions we'll take. Here's the first question. Who is speaking these words? Well, it's Jesus of Nazareth. It's the year 28. He's 31 years old. And now, you know the story. You've, you've followed the Christmas story at Christmas time. You know that an angel came to a virgin girl in her late teens and said she, without the agency of a man, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, was going to bear a child. And the angel described the unborn child as that Holy One who will be born of you. You know that story. You know the story that Joseph was shocked when he found that his wife was pregnant and he wasn't the father, but it was revealed to him by God that that which is conceived in her is being conceived by the Holy Spirit. You know about the shepherds who were told to you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour who is Christ the Lord. They were saying this this baby, this baby is, is God, become man. You know the story of the, the wise men? We don't know how many they were, but this we do know, is that when they discovered the young child, these men, who comes on a long and dangerous and probably expensive journey, they fell down, faces to the ground, and worshipped him. They recognised that this little child was God in human nature. These words are spoken by Jesus of Nazareth. Now, he's 31 years old now. We don't know much about his childhood, just a little snippet here and there. We know one incident from when he was 12 years old. We know nothing really about his adolescence, except that eventually he had become the village carpenter instead of his stepfather Joseph. But we do know that at 30 he'd begun to preach and now, one year later, he's the, the best known person in the whole of Palestine and people from all parts of Palestine and beyond are coming to see and to hear Jesus of Nazareth. He's done all sorts of things which have left people completely bewildered, amazed. Uh, we would say in slang, gobsmacked dumbfounded at a wedding to avoid the embarrassment of the host he's turned water into wine yep he's in Jerusalem with extraordinary authority this 31 year old has driven out of the temple courts 
people who had erected stalls and market stalls, that is, in, in, in the place of worship. How can one man have such authority to, to, to do that? People were amazed at Jesus of Nazareth. In a synagogue, a man who was demon-possessed had been completely delivered from his bondage, from his, this terrible oppression, by Jesus speaking just one short sentence to him. A leper had come to him for healing. He said, nothing's holding you back, Jesus, but I don't know if you're willing. <laughs> I'm willing, says Jesus. And he held out his hand and touched the leper, and immediately the leper was permanently cured of his leprosy. People hadn't seen things like that before, ever. And then he had preached already by the age of 31, the most famous sermon that's ever been preached in the whole of human history, the Sermon on the Mount. It left an astonishing impression upon the countless numbers of people who heard it. He taught them as one having authority and, and not as the scribes. It wasn't a dry intellectual discourse by which Jesus was quoting all sorts of authorities and scholars. He himself spoke with tender authority which left everybody completely dumbfounded again. In another place, someone had come to him, a centurion, a Roman, asking that Jesus would heal his servant, who was in another town. And Jesus spoke the word, and the servant elsewhere had been, was completely healed immediately. In the little town of Nain, as Jesus entered there with his disciples, he'd come across a funeral procession. He'd stopped the procession, gone up to the coffin, seen the weeping widowed mother, who is now losing her son, spoke to the young man in the coffin, who immediately was raised from the dead. All that they had seen, in that by the time he was 31. Within a few more weeks, crossing the Sea of Galilee, that great lake up in the north of Palestine, a terrible storm would, would break upon the boat where he was travelling with experienced fishermen. The fishermen themselves would be terrified. But in a, in a boat being rocked and pitching and blown about and flooded, where no one could stand up, Jesus stood up and spoke to the wind and spoke to the waves, just like a teacher speaking to a naughty class of children, and the waves were stilled, and the wind ceased, and the disciples found that the storm had gone right inside them, because they were asking the question, who, who, who really is this? Who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Yes, within a few weeks, with a word, he would speak to a naked man who lived in a cemetery and cast out the demons from him so that when people came later that day to see the man, he was clothed and in his right mind. A woman would touch just the fringe of his garment and be healed of a hemorrhage that she had had for 12 years. He would walk into the bedroom of a 12-year-old girl, the, d the dead girl, lying there on the bed, pale and lifeless, and would touch her hand and speak to her and raise her from the dead and hand her back to her joyful, joyful parents. Jesus is speaking these words. He looks like God to me, doesn't he? Who can do the things that he did? Who can speak like he speaks? Who could display the love and the tenderness that he displayed? He looks like God to me. And yet, 31 would become 32, and 32 would become 33, and there we would find him in Jerusalem, hated by many, especially the authorities, cruelly, cruelly treated, unjustly tried, false witnesses speaking about him and getting a conviction, crucified on a Roman cross, 
even though the Roman governor said he found no fault in him, laid in a rocky tomb, left from Friday all through Saturday, but on Sunday morning, <laughs> the grave clothes, the grave clothes were undisturbed, but the body had gone. The tomb was empty. The Lord was seen. The disciples were changed. He was resurrected from the dead. And for 40 days, nearly six weeks, he presented himself alive to one here and two there and seven there and eleven there and 500 there, all of whom were able to testify that they had seen him, heard him, touched him, felt him, seen him eat. And then he would ascend into heaven, and he would sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, because there's only one God, but there are three who are God. That's a mystery, baffles us completely. But he whom we call God the Son, now ascends up to where he was before with this difference, that he has a complete and unspoilt and perfect human nature, and yet it bears the marks of crucifixion and suffering. And he speaks. And our question is, who is speaking these words? Why did we put the question in the present tense? Why didn't we say, who spoke those words? Why do we say who's speaking these words? Well, the answer to that is simple. Jesus said, Heaven and earth may pass away, but my words will never pass away. Everything that Jesus ever said, he is still saying. May I say that again? Everything that Jesus ever said, he is still saying. So there you are at home, you've got some terrible problem keeping you awake at night. It's a problem perhaps which is so deep you can't really speak about it to anybody else. So you get up in the night and you open your Bible and you come to chapter 11 of Matthew. And what does it say? What does he say? Come to me. All this difficulty in the family. Is it your marriage? Is it your children? Is it the extended family? Is it finance? It's... But you go to your Bible. You come to Matthew eleven twenty eight. What does it say? What does he say? Come to me. You've got doubts. You've got questions. Come to me. You're a student or you're at work. There's difficulties there. But you take a moment out. You open the Bible. And it's still there. It's always there. 24 hours a day. 365 days a year. Jesus says, Come to me. Come to me. Come to me. So who is speaking these words? Now here's our second question. Who is he speaking them to? Listen. Come to me, he says, all you who labour and are heavy laden. Come to me, all. All you who labour. Those hearers back in first century Palestine they knew all about labour. The vast majority of people who listened to Jesus were agricultural labourers. They knew what it was to get up in the morning early and to work in the fields and throughout the morning the sun got hotter and hotter and they were perspiring and aching and weary and discouraged. There was a brief break in the middle of the day but then still in the heat of the day and all the afternoon and through to the early evening, there they were, labouring away. And they would go home exhausted, eat what they could, sleep best they could, and then it would be the same thing again. 
And again and again they knew what it was to say, I can't go on, I just can't do this anymore. Jesus says, come to me, come to me. You're the person saying, I can't go on, I can't do this anymore. Come to me, all you who labour and are heavy laden. And they knew all about heavy laden. Let's say they had a field to sow. How does the seed get to the field? No tractors, no lorries, no wheelbarrows. Yes, they had an ox or probably a donkey or a, a mule. But then the sacks still have to be filled and lifted and then lifted from the animal to the corner of the field and then up and down they walk with heavy bags of grain. Uh, they knew what it was to bear heavy loads. They knew what it was to be weighed down. And to men and women who say, I can't go on any more. I can't take this a moment longer. T to men and women who say, this is weighing me down. It's, it's crushing me. It's, it's squeezing the life out of me. Jesus says, Jesus of Nazareth says, come to me. Now some of you watching this brief video, you're, you're not yet Christians. And some of you, nonetheless, you have a real sense of sin. You know that God is pure and righteous and kind. You know that he's perfect. You know that he's holy. And now it's clear to you in your heart of hearts that you're not. And you have a great sense of failure and shame you may pass off quite well in the eyes of men and women and people who live around you but you know that in the sight of God you're you're impure in fact you feel dirty and filthy and unworthy I felt like that when I was in my mid-teens I didn't want to feel like that but I did one Sunday night I found myself in a in a chapel in a service and there although the preacher wasn't preaching from this particular passage I knew that the Lord Jesus Christ wanted me to to come to him I knew that something had happened on the cross whereby my sins he had been punished for them my shame he had taken on himself every sanction every penalty I deserved he had taken it for me. I came to him, found forgiveness and peace and all the good things which he's promised. Everlasting life. Yes, even begin in this mortal life. Come to me, he says, if you're crushed with your sins. There's nobody else who's died for sinners. Nobody else loves sinners so much that he's taken their punishment and their place and their shame and their pain. He's well qualified, isn't he, to say, come to me, because he's not dead. He's alive in the power of an endless life. We have a living saviour. And he's saying, come to me. So you're crushed and weighed down and burdened with your sins. And maybe you've, yes, you're not a Christian, but you've got anxiety and care? Are you depressive? Is there some unmet need in your life? Is there something which is just troubling you so much that you, you can't escape it? <laughs> the voice is still sounding. It's the voice of the Son of God. Come to me. And what about that family? Have you got a teenager that's you think it's going astray and you don't seem to be able to do anything about it? Got friction in your marriage? Jesus still says it. Come to me. Are there difficulties at work? Difficulties with your colleagues? Or is the work just too boring? Or too demanding? Come to me. And then you look on society and you think, I don't know what's happening to us. Don't know what's happening in our nation. Don't know what's happening to the world. 
don't think it should be like this. There's so much distrust. There's violence. There's suspicion. There's immorality. There's hate. There's selfishness. And you, you begin to draw the, the catalogue and it's weighing you down now. And you don't know what to do and you're only one voice and there are millions of others and it seems like nothing can be done. And the voice still sounds. The voice of the ages. The voice of the eternal Son of God. Come to me, he says. Now some of you watching this brief video, you, you are Christians. And yet, you feel also crushed with a sense of your sin. You didn't want your Christian life to be like it is, but you failed in so many areas. And in some areas you failed and failed again and failed again and then you failed again. And then when you think you've got victory, it's not long before you failed again. And you think to yourself, is there any hope for me? Jesus says to you, come to me. You've got problems with assurance. You worry, worry, worry whether you're a real Christian or not, or not. You've got problems with guidance. You want to know the will of God, but you don't know what it is. You've got fears, fears of the future, fears of people, fears of situations, fears of death. Come to me. Some of your family don't believe. Your church, you feel, is in a low state, not the spiritual home that you want it to be. Come to me. Society, you see the great need of people, men and women. They seem to be looking everywhere for happiness, except in the one place where they can find it. As someone has said, the, the long history of the human race is a, is a sad history. The vast majority of men and women are looking for happiness everywhere except in God. And you, they won't listen. They don't want to listen. They don't want to know. It's discouraging. But Jesus says to you, come to me. So that's who he's speaking to. So we've found out who's speaking these words and we found out who he's speaking to. Now, we have a final question. What exactly is he saying? Come to me, but how do you do that? Well, he's spiritually present by his Holy Spirit. The invisible world, says the Bible, is the real one. The world which we touch and taste and feel and see is the world which is passing away. Christ is invisibly present. But you know you can be sitting next to someone and feel very distant from them. So, what does it mean to come to Christ? Well, it means you don't keep your distance from him any longer. You get, you get close to him. You come just as you are. You've got doubts. You come with your doubts. You've got questions. You come with your questions. You've got fears. You come with your fears. You've got reservations. You come with your reservations. And you don't say your prayers. You pray. You engage with him. You talk to him. You tell him about your sins. And your doubts. And your fears. And your questions. And you unburden yourself. You tell him everything that's on your heart. You speak to him. You trust him. But the thing that you don't do, you don't stay away from him. And what exactly is he saying? Well, come to me, he says, and I will give you rest. Come on, you laborers, you heavy laden. I will give you rest. What does that mean? Well, Jesus told the most famous story that's ever, ever been written. You'll find it in Luke chapter 15. He told the story of what we call the prodigal son. A boy wanted his share of what the father was going to leave him now. And he was given it 
and he went, on, went off into a far country and he spent a fortune, but it was all selfish spending. And then he ended up with nothing. No money, no friends. The best he could do was find a job feeding pigs. And there he came to his senses. And he thought about the servants which his father had at home. They're better off than I am. They're in a better state than I am. And he started writing a speech in his head. Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no more worthy to be called your son, but make me like one of your hired servants. And with that in his head, he decided to go home. Now, here's some of my favourite words from the Bible. While he was yet a great way off, yeah, while he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and ran to him, fell on his neck and kissed him. Oh, what a welcome he got. The best robe, the best meal, a ring on his finger. Yep, you're really a son. Shoes on his feet. You're not a slave. And how do you think the boy felt? That's what Jesus means. When he says, come to me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's something inside you. It's something in your soul. Which is why he says at the end of this, in this, in this passage, you will find rest for your souls. Jesus gives rest for the soul, for the, in, the inward me. The inward you, the inmost being, the deepest need. Come to me, he says, I'll give you rest. But come to me, but not with a view to going away again. Listen. Come to me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now what did he mean when he talked about the yoke? Well, here's an experienced ox. And here's an inexperienced ox. On this ox's neck is a great big wooden piece by which he's attached to the plough or to the cart or to whatever. But they drive a yoke of oxen. Two oxen go in the yoke. There's the experienced one and the inexperienced one. And if the experienced one goes left, the other one goes left. Right, the other one goes right. Fast, slow, intimately bound together. So the two are really like, like one. And Jesus says, come to me, take my yoke on you. You won't find it hard. You won't find it heavy. You won't find it crushing. You won't find it impossible. Just let me take over, direct the way, do everything. You just remain attached to me. You remain attached to me. So the rest he speaks about isn't inactivity, is it? but it's finding something in Christ which can't be taken away. Everything is sheer, shared, but it's not a tyranny by Christ. He's tender and loving and kind. He takes us close to himself and he says, come to me and stay attached to me and I will never crush you. I'll give you responsibilities but nothing will ever, ever be too much for you. Three wonderful words. Come to me. Come now to me. Come here. Three wonderful words. Well, let's uh, sing our final hymn. And if you have one of the church hymn books, it's 579. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, thou weary one, lay down, thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, weary and worn and sad. 
I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. Let's sing. Let us pray. Our gracious and loving Father, we thank you for the word that we have heard tonight. We pray that we might hear indeed the voice of Jesus. And that, Lord, we know that whatever our need tonight, that need is only truly met in Him. And we pray that we might be able to fall into the kind arms of the one who invites us to come. For this we ask in Jesus' name. And now to the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>